We are nearly finished with our study through Luke's gospel. Shanae and I were talking about it yesterday. We were trying to decide how long we had been in Luke. It's been so long I can't remember when we started. I'll have to look it up and see. I'm sure I've got a record somewhere. But we're down to, I've I've preached you most of the the book of Luke, even through the end, because we've uh, at Easter times or whatever used some of these other passages. There's just a few little gap passages that didn't get included in like an Easter sermon or a Good Friday sermon. And so that's what I'm giving you now. Maybe this one and three or four more that we'll have and we'll be finished with Luke's gospel. So I'm excited to finish this up with you. This passage today is very unique in that it deals with spiritual warfare. And I want to tell you, I don't enjoy spiritual warfare. I don't guess anybody enjoys spiritual warfare, but I don't, I don't consider myself an authority on spiritual warfare. I like to be happy. I don't like to say no. I like to be optimistic and even, what is the old saying? Ignorance is bliss. So like for me, it's just not something that I've ever gotten really into. In fact, I'm foolish sometimes and just pretend like it doesn't exist, but it truly does exist. And I want to give you this sermon this morning from this passage is, Jesus says to Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not. So it's a good um, take on spiritual warfare. I'm going to give you the passage this morning. I'm going to give you too much else in surrounding passages. You could likely find an authority on such things, and they could really help you develop some thinking here and some good and poor practices. I don't know that that's going to be my role this morning except to teach and preach you this passage. Well, let's read. From Luke chapter number 22, beginning in verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and into death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, The cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said nothing. Then he said unto them, but now he that taketh a purse or he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time together to consider your word. We ask for your help during this time. We want to come to know all truth. We want to come to be made like Christ more and more. As we just sang, to be complete in him. And so, Lord, we understand that often the word is a refiner for us. And surely we understand through this passage that often trials in life are things for our refining. So, Lord, if we want to be these trophies of your grace, if we want to be purified and to be made like Christ, we shouldn't think it strange concerning the fiery trials that we face in life, concerning the various things that come to us. But you'll give us wisdom. And you said you would give it liberally in James 1. And so we ask you for that wisdom. And we thank you for a passage today that could provide it. Help us now to be attentive to the word. Help us to be light of your spirit. May we leave here today fully assured what this might look like in our own lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We know from the sequence of the reading, especially during Holy Week, that Jesus was in great danger on this night. Now we come to know that the disciples themselves were also in danger. It's a thought you don't often think about as you go through this. It's so Jesus-focused, and it should be. But here's this sideline information about the devil himself wanting to have the disciples. He wants to wreck them. He wants to sift them as wheat. He wants to pull them apart. So the disciples are up against the deadliest of all enemies here on the earth. And they don't know this. In fact, it seems that maybe they don't even suspect that they are up against an enemy here. And, and, and it's understandable. They are with Jesus. 
They are with the God man, the one who could raise the dead, the one who can walk on water, the one who can heal the sick. So what could any man come and do to them? What could those with swords and clubs do against them? Well, they have Jesus on their side. What they don't realize is the position spiritually that they are in. Richard Pratt said it like this. He said, the disciples at this moment on this night stood in Job's shoes. This is what Jesus is trying to say to Peter here. And it's a note to us as the church. We are on the Lord's side. We win in the end. The church is triumphant. The Christians are more than conquerors. But let us never forget that we have a great enemy. And that there are times that even under God's sovereignty, where he is allowed to come at us, and we are going to face these times. So I want to consider together in this text, Jesus' warning, Peter's self-confidence, and Jesus' preparation. We find Jesus' warning in verse 31 and 32. And he begins by saying, Simon, Simon. It's a solemn address. He is saddened with the conversation that he is about to have. He, he is like a doctor having to go into a room and, and give the patient some bad news. He is going to say to Peter here, this is what's about to happen in your life. Something horrible is coming into your life. So there's emphasis purposely. Simon, not just Simon, but Simon, Simon. There's also a tinge of rebuke in what Jesus is going to say here. But he words this with tenderness and affection. If you remember, it was Jesus who gave Simon the surname or the nickname, Peter. Luke chapter number 6, verse number 14, he had called him this. But here he doesn't say Peter and give this warning. He says, Simon, Simon. Makes me think of growing up, my, my dad gave me the name, William Chance Strickland, my dad and my mom. There's a lot of inconsistencies with the spelling of my name. I'm aware you spell it how you need to, and I'll be happy with that. But my dad never called me William or Chance. I'm a boy from the South. What did my dad call me? Yeah, <laughs> Bubba. <laughs> to my shame. No, not really. But that's just what dad, that's what he would say to me. He'd say, hey, Bubba, I need you to mow the yard. I'd say, yes, sir. But if I ever was needing correction. If ever he was needing to say something serious to me, matter of fact to me, he would say, now Chance, and when you hear your father call you by that name, for you it's different. Maybe they called you by your full name or whatever, but you get the emphasis here. This is what Jesus is doing. He's not saying Little Rock. He's not saying Peter. He's saying Simon, Simon. He, he's calming them down. He's calling them to attention. The one of the hardest times in Peter's life is about to happen. And he a no. And Jesus is aware. And Jesus is heartbroken over this. And he wants to warn Peter. And he wants to love on Peter. And he wants to help Peter through this time. And he says to him, Simon, Simon. There's great affection there. There's pain in Jesus' voice. The, uh, the warning is that Satan wants to sift him as wheat. He says in verse 31, Behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now the address is given directly to Peter, but the you that we find here is actually in the plural. So when he says that he may sift you as wheat, he has desired to have you. He is speaking to Peter, but it's like you and I might say, like if I said, so glad to, I'm so glad to see you this morning. Now, whoever my eyes meet during that time, if I happen to be looking right at Scotty, I'm, I'm not just talking to Scotty. I'm, I'm speaking to the crowd, right? We would say, you all. I'm glad to see you all. Or how else would we say that? Y'all. Y'all or some of you would even say, you guys. okay. <laughs> all y'all is what I was thinking. Which is not right, I know, but it's sure, sure it's fun to say. And that's what, I, that is Jesus' tense here. That's important to note because he is addressing Peter. In fact, when he says in verse 32, I have prayed for thee, he, that is singular. That is just to Peter, not meaning Jesus hasn't prayed for the other disciples. The point I need you to understand here is Satan doesn't just want to have Peter. 
Poor doctrine comes from that. Because upon this, you are Peter, and upon this rock I built my church. And then Peter becomes the first pope and all of this. That's not what's going on here, okay? Satan doesn't just want Peter to try to stop the church. He wants all the disciples. He wants to stop what's going on here. He wants Jesus. He wants Peter. He wants all of the rest. And that is what Jesus says there. Peter, let me have your attention, Peter, for just a moment. Satan desires to have all of you, that he may sift all of you as wheat. Now back to Peter, he says, but I'm praying for you. Peter, you are the one specifically in this instance that is in the crosshairs. But you are also the one in this instance who's going to receive the assurance from Christ. And then Christ is going to go on to say to him, now, once you've gone through this trial, you're the one to help all the rest. So Peter, I'm helping you. And then Peter, you help your brothers. That's exactly how Jesus lays this out here. Satan wants permission. Now that's an important thing for you to note from verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. It's not like he's saying to him, hey, be careful watching around every corner because Satan might be hiding there trying to get you. Now what he's saying there is Satan wants permission from Almighty God to be able to come at you. Now I, I take that as a comfort. Outside of the request of what God will allow, Satan can do nothing. Let me show you this from the scriptures. Turn with me to Job chapter 1. Now, you men who were in Bible study Tuesday night, you've already, we've already studied Job together. But I was, as we were teaching through that Tuesday night, I thought, well, we need to go there on Sunday morning. Best we know at this point in Jesus' life and ministry and Peter's life and ministry, this would be what, what, what is going on there. Now, I think we can make a good case scripturally that since the cross, this situation may have changed in your, your and my lives as far as where Satan is, what Satan is doing, these kinds of things. But at the point that Jesus is speaking to Peter, what I'm going to read to you from Job seems to be the biblical proof for what was going on here. As Jesus says, he hath desired to have you. And you know this story. Job chapter one, verse number six. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth the Lord and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Now, who brought Job up, Satan or God? God. I think this is not to say that so much that God is uh, putting Job out there on display and saying, why don't you try this guy? I think it's proof to us that even in the presence of God, Satan is not allowed to bring up what he wants without God's permission. Now, that, I might be wrong on that, but that seems to be the way Jesus is wording it in Luke 22. And it seems to be the way it plays out in the book of Job. What's the comfort there for the believer? He is the accuser of the brethren. Satan is our enemy. Satan is the accuser. But even then, God will not hear an accusation from him randomly. You only go in the king's presence when you're granted access into the king's presence. And then you only say in the king's presence what the king has allowed you to be able to say when you are in the king's presence. That's always been the case. Verse 10, he goes on to say, Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house? and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Put forth now thine hand, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy faith. Now what is this teaching us about Satan? He hates you and I, and he wants to destroy you and I. Don't, don't buy into any tool of Satan. Don't buy into any deception from Satan. He, he has no good intentions for you ever for any reason. Just, just kick him out of your life. Verse 12, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, chapter two, verse, verse one, it's a repetition of a similar thing. 
So God gives Satan permission. Some things happen in Job's life. And then this, this is going to happen again. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Do you remember when you were a teenager and you finally got your driver's license and you could kind of go and come as you please? You really began to feel like an adult. One of the things that you rebelled against, do you remember what it was? Mom and dad saying, where you been or where you going? You kind of like that freedom and you sort of got to where you didn't want to have to give an answer for yourself anymore. It's another comfort to the believer. What does Satan have to tell God? Where you been? What have you been up to? He's accountable. We often see him as this radical. R.C. Sproul would always say, there are no maverick molecules. And that's something to think about. God is in control. Verse 3 the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou moved me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But now put forth thine hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, save but his life. Okay, you can go back to Luke 22. Now, the story of Job is a total different thing here, and it's a sad thing to consider. The point I want to make to you is best we know up this point, as we get to Jesus saying to Peter, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. How does that even go in the presence of God? Well, Job 1 and 2 lay out for us exactly how that goes. The sons of God presenting themselves before him and Satan has, has, has to be among them. He has to give an answer for where he's been, what he's doing. And only as God brings it up, can he even take liberties to request such things. Now, here Jesus says, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. So I would say like Job, he wants to accuse Peter before God. He wants to accuse the disciples before God. Jesus uses the Greek term here, exitio, which we have in the English as hath desired. It means Satan has requested, but it also carries with it the affirmative sense that the request has been granted. So when he says he hath desired, he's, he's not just saying, hey, there's a possibility out here. The Greek term that Jesus would have used, Peter would have heard and understood to mean it has been asked and it has been answered and this thing's going to happen. Now, We take comfort, though, in the fact that he has to ask for permission. We take comfort in the fact that he doesn't have the right to sift Peter on his own. Satan has to receive permission from God to, to sift Peter. So nothing can touch us that doesn't pass through God's hands. Now that hurts when it's stuff we don't want in life. But as we go through these things and as we get past these things, it's a comfort to know that God knows exactly what we can take and God knows exactly what we are able to come under and that he is proving us through these things. And, and think this through further. Satan wants to destroy Peter. Is that what God wants? God does not want to destroy Peter. So in allowing it, he must have had a purpose in it. In allowing this trial to come upon Peter, God must have had a purpose in allowing it. As with Jesus' temptation in Luke chapter number 4. What is going on there? Jesus is baptized. What is the testimony from heaven? The testimony from heaven is, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then immediately after that, what happens? Jesus is led of the Spirit into the wilderness for what reason? To be tempted of Satan. God ordained it. God allowed it. So we find another principle. Satan wants to destroy Peter. But that's not what God wants. So in allowing this. God has a purpose in it. You have this metaphor of sifting wheat. There's a violent shaking. Intended to. To, to dislodge the chaff. You had to do this to get the, the grain that you needed away from the thing that covered the grain that you couldn't eat once it was time for this harvest. It's, it's a saying here that Satan wants to break Peter apart spiritually. 
As Satan afflicted and tested Job, he seeks to shake Peter up. He seeks to defeat him. So this is Jesus' warning to Peter in Luke 22. But this is not Jesus' point. He offers him this warning, but the point is more than this. Notice verse 32, Luke 22, verse 32. He says, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So after the warning, Jesus also gives Peter the way through. It's not as if he is saying to him, boy, I'd hate to be in your shoes, Peter. No, he is saying to him, Peter, here's what's going on, but here's what you need to know. There is a way through this. What is the way? Jesus said, did Jesus say, I'm going to go to battle against Satan? Did Jesus say, we're going to have Michael wrestle with him? No, that's not what he said at all. He said, Peter, I have prayed for you. He's interceding to God with far greater effect on Peter's behalf. What did he pray? That thy faith fail not. No. Can I speak to the earthlings for just a moment? (laughs) That's not always the prayer we want Jesus interceding on our behalf. We'd rather he pray that our finances fail not. We'd rather that he pray that our health fail not. We'd rather that he pray that our relationships fail not. He didn't say that to Peter. There's going to be a relational breakdown between Jesus and Peter within 24 hours here. He tells Peter that. Before the cock crows in the morning, you're going to deny that you even know me. All of these forsook and fled, Matthew tells us. No, Jesus just prayed that in the midst of all of this, that his faith would not fail. Satan is a powerful enemy. 1 Peter chapter 5. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Now, verse 6 and 7 are nice lead-ins to verse number 8. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. We were taught that at Bible Campus Kids. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting. We did a casting. All your care upon Him, for He careth for you. And then He gets to the enemy. Verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is a powerful enemy. He is spending every waking moment of every day going to and fro in the earth. He's walking about. Have you been to the zoo? Have you seen the lion cage? He doesn't want to be caged up. What do the lion do? They pace back and forth. Every zoo that I've ever been to, that's what the lion does when they're active. Sometimes they just lay around. But they pace back and forth, back and forth. What are they doing? Well, one instinct a lion has is to seek what it may devour so that it can eat. I imagine a cage lion wants to get out of that cage and roam free. But our enemy, Satan, is a powerful enemy. Peter writes of him here just like that roaring lion. But never forget who he's up against. He's not up against you and he's not up against me. That's not our role in all of this. Jesus is the groom. We're just the bride. He's up against the lion of the tribe of Judah. Praise the Lord. He is a powerful enemy. We need to be sober. We're to be vigilant. But the conqueror of that enemy is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he says here, Peter, I've prayed for you. Grant Osborne says the prayers of Jesus nullify his nefarious activities and enable God's people to overcome Aren't you glad of that? So let's take a moment here and consider spiritual warfare is given in this passage. What do we know so far? Satan does not have free access to us. That's, That's one thing we know for sure. Number two, he is at all times under the control and the power of our God. Harder for us to understand than just believe. Sometimes we look around in the world and say, wait, you mean God allowed that? Well, God allowed man to sin in the garden, didn't he? Just because God allows something doesn't take away his sovereignty over the thing. And I get that that's a hard thing to wrestle with in our humanity. And and I just often will attribute that to the incomprehensibility of our God. 
He is more than we will ever be. And so there's always got to be things that don't, we, we can't quite find equality in our minds with. Satan does, have, does not have free access to us. He's at all times under the power and control of our God. Number three, as the demonic powers try us, Christ intercedes for us. Isn't that a great comfort? So as these things come at you in life, you have Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, in God's ear. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And, and He's interceding for you. He's saying, now Lord, you, God, we've got to help them in this. Don't, we've got to make sure their faith doesn't fail in this. We've got to get them through this. He's interceding for us. I don't know what He prays, but He prays that our faith fail not. The fourth thing I would conclude about spiritual warfare is this is the thing that leads us to being more than conquerors. We like that term. We like that idea. Go to Romans chapter 8. John Acts Romans. You're in Luke. Just flip to the right a few books and look at Romans chapter 8. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As we must surrender ourselves to the watchful care of Christ and the Holy Spirit to be more than conquerors, the strength is there. It exists to enable us to not fail. But we must partake of it. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us, but we must partake of this strength that exists to enable us not to fail. That's what Jesus says here. He says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Not that the father won't allow this trial. Not that the father will stop Satan from being able to come at Peter to try to sift him as we. But he says, no, the Satan has asked permission. The father has allowed this. So he wants to have you to sift you as we. I'm praying for you as you're being sifted around that your faith will not fail. Peter would fail. Peter will forsake. Peter would flee. But what do we find in the end? When all of the dust settles, his faith remains. Now that's hard. We, we often want sinless perfection. We often want things to not go with any, any, any error, any wrong, any wrong turns from human ways of thinking of things. We want it to just, we say, well, if, if it's God's will, it'll, it'll go as God wants. In our minds, what that means is, is everything will go seamlessly. I would say from Peter's perspective, the next few days do not go seamlessly. He forsakes knowing Christ. He leaves this life of discipleship and goes back to his old life. He finds out that Christ has died. Now it takes a turn there, but these next few days for Peter are are awful. Richard Pratt says, failure does not have to be the last word. Satan can win a battle but still lose the war. And we know that he loses the war. Notice the confidence Jesus speaks with in regards to Peter's faith. He says, I have prayed for thee, verse 32, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He doesn't say, if, you, if, you're, if you're converted. He doesn't say, Peter, I've prayed for you, And if everything goes right, here's what I would tell you to do next. No, he just says, when this happens. Now, he's not talking about conversion for salvation. The word that he uses there in the Greek that we have in the English is converted. means to turn back. To return to a previous state or way of life. So, Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are turned back, what is Jesus admitting to there? You're going to turn away. You're going to forsake. You're going to flee. But you're going to turn back. And when you turn back... This is not a possibility. This was a certainty. Jesus was sure that Peter's faith would not fail him. 
How can he be so sure? Because Peter's faith had found Jesus as the object of his faith. Faith in Christ will never fail us. He's so sure here that he gives him instructions for once, what he's to do once he's passed this trial. Strengthen your brethren. Satan desired to have them all. And they would all forsake Peter, in his turning back, would learn how to lead them in doing the same. He would lead them in turning back. So this is Jesus' warning to Peter. You will experience defeat, but it will not be the complete spiritual failure that Satan wants from you. Afterwards, you will use what you gain from this to help the rest. Warren Wiersbe says it like this. Peter's courage failed, but not his faith. He was restored to fellowship with Christ and was greatly used to strengthen God's people. Now, all that we've just worked through is very fantastic. There's just one issue. There's there's more verses. (laughs) Jesus has said unto him, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you may sift you as wheat, but I pray for you, your faith fail not. But what what does the next verse say? 33, the speaker changes, and it's Peter talking, and what does Peter do? He said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. The issue is us. It's me, it's you, it's Peter. It's this human carnal nature that we have of self-confidence. Jesus is very intimately, very in a relational kind of a way saying to Peter, this is what's going to happen. I'm praying for you. You're going to get through this. In the end, here's how you need to handle this as you move forward. And Peter says, I'm ready, Lord. I'll never forsake you. He, he says in verse 33, I'm ready to go with you both into prison and to death. Earlier, he had said during the supper, I, I would never, I'll never forsake you. Jesus, I, I won't have to turn back, he's saying here. Do you, did you, do you sense this in the, the flow of the conversation? Jesus Christ, the Son of God in the flesh, has said to Peter, here's what's going to happen, but in the end, You'll, you'll be able to turn back to where you are. And what is Peter doing there? He's refuting him. He's saying, I won't have to turn back because I'll never forsake you. And his proof for that is, I would go with you to prison and I would go with you to death. Now here's a note for us in our humanity. We're, we're very fine with prison and maybe even death. Persecution and martyrdom for our faith. In fact, I think we would prefer that than the sifting of Satan. Do you catch that in our humanity? Because it's in our realm. It's in the physical. It's not in the spiritual. In the spiritual realm, it's so out of our touch. It's so out of our control that it's so uncertain to us that it it just runs us ragged. But in the physical realm, it's fine. Martin Luther, here I stand. I could do no other. Take me away. Peter is, Peter is being that here. I'll go with you, Jesus, to prison. I'll go with you to death. And Jesus has just said to him, that's not the fight we're about to fight here. The life of the disciple of Christ is rarely full of warfare, fault in the physical. Prison, persecution, martyrdom. The life of a disciple of Christ is a life filled with battles, fault in the spiritual. We hold prayer warriors in very high respect in the church. And we will often see them as someone who, well, they couldn't do this, that, or the other, but boy, they sure could pray. And and we kind of see them as this, you know, just simple, maybe not strength. There's not a lot of strength seen there. They're just humanly speaking. We wouldn't put them as a warrior, but I think spiritually speaking, when we find a true prayer warrior, we would see them maybe as we might imagine Michael or Gabriel. Strong. Their armor's the best. Their sword is sharpened and it's ready to be used. Their helmet and their shin guards are shined up. Their boots are ready to trod. This is what a prayer warrior looks like spiritually. Can you let your mind this morning leave the physical and enter into the spiritual there for just a moment and see this. The, the life of a disciple of Christ is a life filled with battles fought in the spiritual. 
Now, Jesus' response to Peter is a little less intimate this time. It's a little less somber. Verse 34, he said, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. He says, hey, I hear what you're saying, Peter, but what you aren't aware of yet that I know is you're going to deny me three times, not just the one, but three times. From there, we get Jesus's preparation. Verse 35 to 38. The disciples need to be prepared for what is about to happen. Jesus is going to be taken. All of them will flee and forsake him. Matthew 26, 56 tells us that he will be crucified and he will die. The preparation that he gives them up against what is coming is encouragement. Verse 35, he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said, nothing. He took care of them at that time. He will continue to do so in this crisis time. In verse 36, he clues them in that this time is not going to be like that. Then he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Jesus is saying here, this time will not be like last time, but now. Remember then, but now. This is not going to be like last time. Then I told you to go without a purse. Then I told you to go without a script or without shoes. But now I'm telling you, if you have to sell your coat to get a sword, do it. It's a shift in message. The life of the disciples has been mostly peaceable up to this point. But now things would be changing. R.C. Sproul says, Jesus is warning them that everything is about to change. Whereas they were once welcomed because of him everywhere they went, all that has changed, the world is about to turn on them in hatred because of him. Can you imagine that? You've once been welcome into towns because Jesus healed all your sick. And now if they find out that you're with them, well, we're going to kill you right alongside them. So Jesus is saying here, I sent you out before without stuff and I took care of you, but I'm about to go away. And so he said, you better have your stuff in order and you might ought to get yourself a defense. Now, we, we need to view this preparation and this shift in Jesus's message in the proper context. He's just instructed through the interaction with Peter that theirs would be a spiritual warfare more than a physical. Not that there would be no physical fight, not that there would be no physical persecution. Certainly these guys face that. But if we take this too far, you could make the point that Jesus is telling them in here to arm up and let's overthrow the Romans. Or arm up and let's overthrow this arrest party as they come for us. That's certainly not what he's saying. In fact, we find when the arrest party comes, he doesn't have literal fighting in mind. Look at verse 49. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? And one of them smote the ear of the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Who did that? Peter. And Jesus answered and said, suffer ye thus far. What does that mean? It's enough of this. And he touched the ear and he healed him. So while he says here, let him sell his garment and buy a sword in verse 35, the, the tense is not to say, let's arm up and be the church militant. What he is saying here is you're going to have to be militant to some extent because the world is about to come at you, though it's been peaceful toward you up to this point. You've got to be ready for the hard times that you're going to experience not so much in the days to come, which was a thing for them, but more so in their future ministry of establishing God's church on the earth. But they missed Jesus' point. He, he, he goes on to say here in just a second, or, or they'll come back and say, well, we have two swords. And he said, that's enough of this talk. Why does he want to stop this talk? They're missing the point that this is a spiritual war, not a physical they are going to need the full armor of God to fight this war. Go to Ephesians 6. You know these verses, but I want to make sure you can get there in your Bible. These are familiar verses for you, but I want to rehearse them before you this morning. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. How are we to be strong? 
In ourselves? No, in Him and in His might. Whose strength do we use? His strength. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What do I do under the attack of the devil? You draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. You put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. And here's what it looks like. For we fresh will not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. Know your enemy. It's not your neighbor whose leaves get into your yard every fall after you've just gotten your leaves up. No, it's, it's spiritual warfare that we're dealing with here. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand an evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. There is the first element that we are to take unto ourselves to be able to stand against the attack of Satan. Truth. What is truth? God's word is truth. Have your loins girt about with truth. What do I do when I'm attacked by Satan? Read your Bible. What do I do when I'm re- done reading my Bible? Read it some more. What about after that? Read it some more. Don't stop. till the fight's over, just keep reading your Bible. Don't I need to have a seance? Don't I need to have a poltergeist moment? No, just read the Bible. He said, well, I don't think it's doing anything. Fine, just keep reading it. Gird yourself up with truth. And having on the blessed plate of righteousness, where does righteousness come from? Christ. It's not our righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is the gospel of peace? Christ has died. Christ is buried. Christ is risen again. And above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith is your shield. What kind of faith? I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. No. It's faith that has the resting place in the object of Jesus Christ. I don't think I can withstand anything. I don't think I can hold off the fiery darts of the wicked one at all on my own. But, but I'm not the lion to fight the lion. Jesus is, but I'm his bride. He will not stand for an attack against his bride. Any man in here this morning just say, sure, go for it. Slander my wife. Push her around a little bit. I don't mind. No Archie Bunker is not at church this morning, is he? Oh, come on. Now that was pretty good. (laughs) Y'all are really asleep. Raise your hand if you don't know who Archie Bunker is. Yeah, all right. That's the problem with the joke. No, a man would not stand for this. He would fight for his bride. You can't insult the church. You can't undermine the church. You can't come at the church. What is Satan doing when he desires to have Peter to sift him as wheat? Desires to have the apostles to sift him as wheat? He's attacking the bride of Christ. He's not going to win that war. Nor when he attacks you when you are the bride of Christ. So you take the shield of faith, which will allow you to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is a spiritual warfare. We're going to need the spiritual armor of God to fight it. Now, from there, Jesus reminds them. you can go back to Luke 22. I'm nearly finished. He reminds them of his purpose in verse 37. For I say unto you that this is written. That this, that is written, much yet, yet be accomplished in me. And then he says what is written, and then behind the colon, he gives more explanation. So what was written? And he was reckoned among the transgressors. Now this is a quote from Isaiah 53, verse 12. Isaiah 53, verse 12 says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So when Jesus quotes here that he was reckoned among the transgressors, what he is saying to his disciples that must be fulfilled is that being numbered with the transgressors, Isaiah prophesied that he would bear the sin of many and then make intercession for the transgressors. What has he just told Peter that he is doing? Making intercession for him that his faith fell not. How would that ultimately be accomplished? In that he went to the cross 
and bear the sins of many. So they would say, let's fight against this arrest party. And Jesus said, the fight would be fruitless if I don't go to the cross. So we're going to lay down arms and I'm going to go to the cross. And in what the world sees as a defeat, we're going to have the greatest victory that the world has ever known since the curse. And then he says, for the things concerning me have an end. Now his disciples behind that say in verse 38, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. They're missing the point. They're still trying to dig up some weapons. He realizes that they've taken what he said about swords literally. And in replying, it is enough. He is saying, that's enough of that sort of talk. Look at verse 51. That's where he says it again there. Jesus answered and said, suffer you this far. No, no more of this kind of talk. They were thinking only in the moment. Only in the physical, only in the temporal. They seemed to think that they could stop the attempt of his enemies to kill him by the use of swords. But this is the farthest thing from Jesus' mind in this moment. Lloyd Ogilvy remarks, Jesus is saying, enough of this. You've missed the point. Which is that the strategy must change. A year or two ago, I was popular. You went in my name and were received gladly. In a few days' time, I will be killed and you will have no popularity. You are to prepare for those days. As we study through these verses and think on them, I wonder if Christ ever looks at the American church and says, enough of such talk. I don't know what it is that comes to your mind when I make that statement, but what is it that we're so wrapped up in that's, that would just be frustrating to him if he were talking to us this morning? This is a spiritual war. This is not a physical war. We are like Peter, aren't we? I'll go with you to prison and even to death. And Jesus says, you're, you're not hearing what I'm saying to you. It's going to be worse than that. Satan is going to sift you like wheat. He's going to violently try to wreck your life. You wish you could just go to prison. You wish you could just go to death. This is going to be worse than that. What is it for us as the American church that we're not willing to face and we're, we're dealing with all these other things? Here, Jesus, here's some swords. And in reality, what he is saying to us is get the sword of the Spirit, get the helmet of salvation, get the shield of faith. You better get ready. We will someday conquer. We will someday rule. We will someday rule and reign with him. But for now, what are we? We're, we're more than conquerors. We don't, we don't have to conquer in the physical to prove ourselves to him. He's already died for the church. And he's already made us more than conquerors. The, in Romans 8, what we read earlier about that, that Greek word, and then there's a Latin term that goes with it. It, it means super conquerors, hyper conquerors, supermen. Some of you men needed to hear that this morning, didn't you? You really are a superman, but only in the spiritual sense. William Hendrickson says a conqueror is a person who defeats the enemy. One who is more than a conqueror causes the enemy to become a helper. We are not just here to defeat the enemy. We cause the enemy to become a helper. Why would God allow Peter to face this trial? Because in going through this trial, it got Peter ready for what God wanted him to be able to do in the future. So Satan, in desiring to have him, to sift him as wheat, was actually refining him and strengthening him and getting him ready for what God wanted him to do. If Peter was rocky getting ready to go to the boxing ring, that makes Satan Mick. He's the trainer. He's the one just getting him set for the fight. We have hardships in life. We have forces in life that we must face. But, and they hurt us in the moment. They hurt us for the time. But we've got to understand these things are also helping us. They all work together for good. Not always our good. Not always the good that we would prefer. But for his good and his glory. R.C. Sproul, I'll end with R.C. Sproul. He says, the New Testament says it is the Christian who is the Superman. It is the Christian who rises to the supreme level of conquest. It is the Christian who has at his disposal the power to conquer which no one else can find. In fact, Christianity, instead of diminishing our manhood our strength and our authentic existence enhances them. 
In Christ, we don't conquer people in bloodbaths of fights, but we conquer trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, and the sword. We are more than conquerors. Is Jesus saying to you this morning, it's enough. I want you to be more than a conqueror, not whatever it is that you can't quit talking about. Here, Jesus, look what I've got. He's offering a warning here. He's giving preparation, encouraging preparation here. Are we going to be like Peter, though, and just resort to our typical self-confident ways? All right, I went to church this morning. I'm, I'm bucked up. I'm ready to go. Nah. Why don't we face it in humility? Why don't we say, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. How are you going to defeat Satan tomorrow? I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to die. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to desire, die to my desires. I'm going to die to my pleasures. I'm going to die to my sinning. And I'm going to say, Lord, what would you have me to do today? And I'm going to read the word. And then we pray. And we read the word some more. And then we pray some more. And we read the word some more. And we pray some more. And we take on the day knowing that there's a battle being fought that doesn't always come before our eyes. And we do it in the confidence that we are more than conquerors. Let's stand and pray.